The Electric Prunes are not the number one psychedelic rock band of the 1960s. They're not even number two or number 20. But they are emblematic of it. They have two albums which are classics of the garage rock genre, and two more albums which are so weird that they have to be heard to be believed. One day, I was browsing on eBay. It's one of my main sources of inspiration, and I never get bored of just typing in some stupid term and seeing what comes up, and then clicking on the settle, and then seeing what the seller has. And it was one of these sessions that I found this. It was listed as a Lost Electric Prunes album from 1968 which immediately struck me as weird because I wasn't aware of any Lost Electric Prunes records. Furthermore, a quick Google search showed me that the Electric Prunes actually had two real albums from 1968. So I decided to investigate. On side A was the purported unreleased LP, dated to September of 1968. On side B, a live recording of a gig they played in 1967, and I guess the owner of the tape got bored because he also put the only ones and new order on there too. The prospect of a Lost Electric Prunes record was so exciting to me because they are one of my favourite 60s bands. And a Lost record from this era is completely feasible. 1968 was a tumultuous year for the Prunes, as I'll get into. Just so you don't feel like you've been clickbaited, I'll say up front that the contents of Side A turned out not to be the Lost Electric Prunes tape. But I did find a story of real intrigue and enough obscurities that I don't think you'll be dissatisfied by the end of the video. On today's episode, we'll be looking at the weird trajectory that the Electric Prunes took. It's a story that takes place over the course of decades and contains scandalous label shenanigans. This is the story of how a band's reputation, output, and very constitution can change due to strange external factors. So join me, won't you? Because, because in the history of popular music, there is an established pattern. Great records and known legends. That's fine, but we can do better. Let me take you to a world of boots and also legs. I'll be telling the stories of the fake and the leap exploring stolen tapes and lost recordings. It's a moral dark zone, but in it are some of music's most fascinating stories. And today, we're looking at the icons of 1960s psychedelic rock, The Electric Prunes. Looking back on it, I can scarcely believe that the 1960s actually existed. The CIA was experimenting unethically on its own population, and the people were engaging in love feasts, which are not the same thing as swingers parties, okay? They are distinctly different, right? Look at this article I found in a 1960s magazine, okay? Love feasts are not swingers parties. A revolution was happening in the streets, in the sheets, and on the sheets of music. The soundtrack to these radical times was psychedelic guitar music and it rocked. In 1965, James Lowe was forming a band. They formed in LA, and this is relevant because basically everything I talk about in this video is so very LA. The first version of the band was called Jim and the Lords, and it was very much inspired by the surf rock and the blues that they liked. It still had the role in rock and roll. Gonna tell my Mary about Uncle John. As a garage rock band, they were playing in a literal garage, and they started taking themselves seriously and really grinding out rehearsals. It was during one of these rehearsals that an estate agent who just happened to be passing by thought it sounded good and knew a contact at RCA Records. I told you this shit was so LA. The contact at RCA was one Dave Hassinger, who'd done some production work for the Rolling Stones and was looking for a Rolling Stones of his own. Under the guidance of Dave, they were encouraged to sound more like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Hassinger also encouraged them to pick a better name. 
because Jim and the Lords sounded outdated even for 1965. The name was based off a joke. What's purple and goes buzz? An electric prune. Is that true? I, I don't think that's true. They put out a 7-inch that went nowhere, completely died. Instead of giving up on them, Dave Hassinger instead had them sign a contract that could fairly be called abusive. The contract was so bad that the drummer quit on the spot. It seemed like the band's weakness was their songwriting. So, Annette Tucker was brought in as a collaborative songwriter for their next single. She was a good fit, as her past work included the song I Ain't No Miracle Worker, which was recorded by the band The Brogues. I beg you to remember I'm just an ordinary guy I ain't no miracle worker I do the best that I can Annette Tucker's songwriting proved to be a perfect fit for the Electric Prunes' sound, and the resultant song was I Had Too Much To Dream Last Night. I had too much to dream last night Too much to dream I'm not ready to face the light I had too much to dream The song went all the way to number 11 on the US charts. When you listen to it, the song stands out in the way that good pop music should, even from the opening with the woozy, psychedelic, reversed guitar effect that they have. The song can be interpreted a few ways, as a breakup song, as a hangover song, or as just a plain old druggy psychedelic song. The verses see the narrator at night indulging in the fantasy of remembering what it was like to be with his lover. The choruses then see him confronting the reality of daylight where he is in fact alone. The band plays this perfectly as well. The verses are played smooth and pleasantly psychedelic, and then sunlight comes with the crash of drums and the choruses are harsh and distorted. The way they used to be. Your gentle hand reached out to comfort me. Then came the and you were gone. Credits to Dave Passenger on the production of this as well. It's produced in a heady way, with lots of cool sounds. The song was enough of a success that the band was able to quit their day jobs and become the Electric Prunes full time. I'd wager if you'd heard of the band before this video, it would be because of this song's inclusion on the compilation Nuggets, original artifacts from the psychedelic era. You see, 60s garage rock was a lot like punk in that a lot of bands were inspired to pick up guitars and make music, but a lot of the time it only resulted in one or two singles, or maybe an album. And a lot of these bands were not lucky enough to be in Los Angeles, and have been forgotten to time and their 7-inch output become rare collector's items. There's a great playlist on YouTube from DJ Mean Mojo Matias, who's uploaded rips of lots of his collection, which I highly recommend to get yourself into the 60s garage headspace. Unfortunately though, YouTube playlists were not available to our friends in the 20th century. But people still wanted to show off their stuff. This led a record store clerk from New York under the name Lenny Kay to put together a compilation of his favourite 60s garage rock songs and release it as a compilation. Nuggets is a great listen, and it's also of historical importance. Due to its success, it inspired a trend of copycats and also became a series in and of itself. You've got Nuggets, original artifacts from the psychedelic era, Nuggets Volume 2, not to be confused with Nuggets 2, Children of Nuggets, Nuggets Volume 2 from the 12 volume 80s series, Nuggets, a classic collection from the psychedelic 60s, and then you've got the stuff that inspired such as the extensive 28 volume Pebbles series, the Pebbles Companion series highs in the mid 60s, the Psychedelic States series, and then outside of Garage Rock, Nuggets becomes the generic term for any compilation of overlooked songs in a genre. And speaking of generic terms, 
the original Nuggets album is also the first known instance of when the term punk gets used to describe rock music. Sorry, Lester Bangs, you fucking poser. All of this is to say that Nuggets has been influential to critics, musicians, and fans in the decades since its release. And the Electric Prunes were track one on the original. But let's go back to 1967 now, where the Electric Prunes were struggling to follow up their hit. They worked with Annette Tucker again for the rest of the songs on their debut album, but the album only reached 113 on the Billboard Top 100. Their second album fared even worse, because none of the singles were hits, and it peaked at 172 on the Billboard 200. Touring was a mixed bag for the Electric Prunes. They were well received in London and got to party with some big names. They even got to party in the Playboy Club in Mayfair during its 60s heyday. The touring did have a brutal schedule, however, and the manager wanted them to wear stupid costumes that the band hated. After touring their second record, it was understood that something needed to change given the dwindling results of their latest output. Allow me to introduce David Axelrod. Axelrod made a name for himself as a producer in the jazz scene, notably with the hard bop artist Cannonball Adderley. The man's tastes were eclectic. He was not just into the cool jazz and hard bop scenes, but he was also known around LA as a budding neoclassical composer. So when the Electric Prunes came off tour, they were told their third album was going to be written and led by David Axelrod. In 1968, with Axelrod in creative control, their new record was decided. It would be ambitious. It would be bold. It would be a fusion of Gregorian chants hymns and other Catholic music with the classic Prunes Garage Rock sound. And they really thought that this album was going to be the record that would make their careers. Gloria, Gloria, Gloria. This is a strange record, because as well as that hymnal stuff, they also do take it to the really fried acid psychedelic place with crazy guitar solos too. Oh yeah, that's the shit. Let's have another one. I beg you to listen to this record, because this scorching stuff exists right next to shit like this. Credo. Electric Prunes then get approved to do another record in this style. But the timeline splits like goddamn Legend of Zelda. Yes, this is the stupidest graphic I've ever made for a video. Let me explain what I'm talking about. 
after a disastrous live show, no creative control, and not even getting any money because of their horrible contract, all of the original members quit. The Electric Prunes go full ship of Theseus and become David Axelrod and a session band. And this version of the Electric Prunes puts out an album that's even more orchestral than the last one. It's just like, how did we get here? Strings? Orchestra? The Prunes were like a four-piece garage rock band with guitars and rock. So what happened? Somebody set the Prunes up the bomb. Main screen turn on. There's two people we can blame here. The most commonly blamed guy is Hissinger, the person who hooked them up in the first place. Because in that abusive contract, he actually owned the name The Electric Prunes. So even if all the members quit, he still had The Electric Prunes and could put new members in and release it as an Electric Prunes record. <laughs> Which he did after this, by the way. But there's another person that I think we can blame as well. You see, Hassinger wasn't actually the band's manager. That was a guy called Leonard Puncher. Now, information was kind of hard to find about Lenny. But, when I found it, it revealed a lot about what was probably going on here. Lenny Puncher wasn't really a psychedelic rock guy. He'd cut his teeth in the Latin music scene. He was really all about Cuban bands, and cha-cha music, and people like Tito Puente. So, the psychedelic music really wasn't his thing. And, he was also managing David Axelrod. So when David Axelrod wanted to flex his muscles and see what he could do, I can definitely see Lenny Poncha deciding that he can sacrifice the electric prunes on the whims of Axelrod. This is, of course, conjecture on my part, but it's pretty clear from interviews that the prunes have given after the fact that they felt their arms were kind of twisted in the matter. And in my research, I did find quotes where there's just shots taken all over the place. Look at this. Here's an article where David Axelrod says that actually... Mass in F minor is basically entirely him, and that the band weren't involved. And here's another article where he says, The electric prunes? Fuck em. They dissed me. That's juicy. That's a juicy prune! So, with all of this CONTEXT going on in 1968, you can see why I was so excited at the prospect of a lost Electric Prunes album from this era. So, let's take a listen. Alright, the moment of truth, let's pop this puppy in and see what's on it. So it sounds like the classic garage rock prunes, but the the singer doesn't sound right. Let me just try something. After all that, it's not the electric prunes. It's just a completely different band. But, there are some interesting things of note here. It's actually a complete copy of the album Teen Dreams by Kenny and the Casuals. This record is extremely rare, as only 200 were ever pressed. It's currently selling for £500, but copies have gone for as much as £1,245. The song Journey Into Time isn't even actually that unknown. It even appears on an extended reissue of Nuggets. I didn't catch this on the listing on eBay, because all of the song titles are misnamed. 
and I'm actually not sure if this is genuine mistake on behalf of the bootlegger or an attempt to throw off sleuths like myself. And there's another cool connection with Nuggets as well. Kenny and the Casuals reformed in the late 70s to take advantage of the punk movement. During this era, they toured as an opening act for Patti Smith. And who else was in Patti Smith's band? Lenny Kay, that record store worker who put together Nuggets in the first place. Ain't that kinda neat. But the story's not over. Let's see what everyone else got up to after 1968. Dave Hassinger got out of producing in 1969 when he bought a building in Hollywood and built the Sound Factory recording studio. The Sound Factory has had countless legends record there. Just look at this list. It's a decent legacy, but he's got nothing on David Axelrod. After the Prunes split up, Capitol Records signed him to make some solo records in the same vein. And he put out two albums which were inspired by the poetry of William Blake. The first of which also came out in 1968. This man had three records in 1968. What the fuck? He put out a few more records through the 70s and kept producing jazz albums, working closely with Lou Rawls and Cannonball Adderley. He had a fairly quiet 80s. But in the 90s, something really interesting happened. With the advent of sampling, people were rediscovering his records and being a drummer himself, David Axelrod's productions tended to be fairly beats heavy and this shit was gold for hip hop. I mean, just listen to this. His records were sampled by Dr. Dre, DJ Shadow, Quasimoto, A Tribe Pulled Quest, Mad Lib, Lauren Hill, Jay Dilla, and loads more. But what's really cool is how cool he was with it. He actually became close friends with DJ Shadow as a result of the sampling. And Axelrod, inspired by DJ Shadow sampling his older work, dug into his own archives, found an unreleased Electric Prunes album, and sampled it. What? This is repeated everywhere online. It's on Wikipedia. Even my main man Scaruffy says it on his website. I had to check this out. I've got here the Deluxe Gatefold 2LP edition of this record, which most importantly comes with extensive liner notes. Let's take a look. Written by DJ Shadow, these liner notes contain rapturous praise for the axle rod, but curiously there's no mention of the electric prunes. Instead, it says this. The material on this album was written over 30 years ago. Always the visionary. David had been toying with the concept of recording an album on reprise. The album was going to be based on Goethe's Faust, because of course it was. Interpretive lyrics were written by Steve Poncher, son of David's longtime manager, Lenny. Lenny Poncher. Axelrod went into the studio and recorded the rhythm tracks. And at the end of the session, an acetate was cut as reference. Okay, so what is actually on this record? Nine songs have resulted from the venture, seven of them being the original acetate tracks with additional strings and texturing, and two completely new works. So there's no mention of the electric prunes. Is this just an Axelrod solo album? Well, these liner notes say that the Faust-inspired album was going to be released by Reprise Records. But David Axelrod wasn't signed to Reprise Records, he was signed to Capitol. Do you know who was signed to Reprise? The Electric Prunes. So it does seem like this was intended to be an Electric Prunes album in the style of Mass in F minor or Release of an Oath. But what even is an Electric Prunes record? I made this frankly silly chart earlier, but it, it kind of illustrates the point I'm trying to make where there's about three things that you can call the Electric Prunes. Axelrod himself doesn't even think that Mass in F minor counts and like the band played on that record let alone release of an oath. It sure sounds like that other stuff. 
do you think that this counts as a Lost Electric Prunes album? Because I honestly don't know. Like, ontologically, what is an Electric Prunes album? Which ones count? What do you think? <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below. But let's say you're a Prunes purist. Let's take a look at what happened to James Lowe and the other members who played on the first two records. James says that the reason he quit the band is that he was being treated poorly and just wasn't seeing the money, and he was sick of it. And I totally believe him. I think I know where Dave Hassinger's money to buy the LA studio came from. The Easy Rider soundtrack? He didn't see a penny of it. And he wasn't even aware that he was on the Nuggets compilation until decades later when his son told him. He was a sound engineer on a bunch of Todd Rundgren's projects, and through Todd, he met the band Sparks. Because of his work as an engineer with Todd, he was given the opportunity of producing the Sparks' second album, A Woofer in Tweeter's Clothing. He loved the Sparks, and he vowed if A Woofer in Tweeter's Clothing was not successful, that he'd quit music and find something else to do. The album didn't even crack the top 200. They released a single from it, didn't hit the charts either. And true to his word, James quit music. But the story of the Prunes doesn't end there, because over the course of decades, and countless reissues of Nuggets, the cult following around the Electric Prunes just grew, and in the 90s, he was approached to release a best of the Electric Prunes. Over 30 years later, he tracked down the original members and reformed the Electric Prunes. And then, in 2001, they released a new album. They called it Artifact. Now, I don't need to tell you why that's an interesting name. But what's even more interesting than the name is the fact that it was really good. Okay, really good might be an exaggeration, but it is definitely good. All the compositions are quite simple, but that doesn't really matter because it's kind of a vibe record, and it's also harkening back to the garage rock, which was just four chords in a dream anyway. But also, I'm just kind of stoked this exists. They self-released this album, and they advertised it as the real third Electric Prunes album. So that kind of tells you the relationship that they have with uh, the stuff they did with Axelrod. And then they just didn't stop. They kept going for over 10 years. Their last record was in 2014, but they did four records since reuniting. And that's on top of touring and running their website and doing the management themselves. The downside to managing yourself is you've also got to promote yourself. And the first record actually got a decent amount of uh, recognition as people went, hey, the Electric Prunes are back together. That's interesting. But that trick only really works once, and each subsequent release got less and less attention, and their most recent record seems to be genuinely overlooked. Like, it has one rating on RateYourMusic.com. Which seems absurd, like, this is Rate Your Music, and these are a known band. It's not just Rate Your Music, either. Lots of people stop telling the Electric Prune story at Artifact. I'm not going to tell you that those later reunion albums are the best things ever, but they're worth hearing, and I think that they improve on artifact. I think that the band gets more confident in their ability to play, the chops get better, and the songwriting improves too, I think. That's a schnasty riff to be putting out at that stage in your career. Sadly, was, probably is, the last Electric Prunes record. Founding bassist Mark Tulin died during the production of that record. They finished off the songs without him, but I think James thinks that that's a good way to end the Electric Prunes story. So what have we ended up with here? We've got a Lost Electric Prunes cassette that ended up just being a rare record from a different band. 
We've got an album from David Axelrod that was originally meant to be released as an Electric Prunes record, but had none of the original members on it. And we've got an album from the original members that is released but genuinely overlooked. I find the story of the Electric Prunes so fascinating because of how many other people's stories it touches. People like to think of bands and musicians as these indivisible units, creating in isolation and static in time. But the world of the Electric Prunes is so vast, from Annette Tucker to Patti Smith to DJ Shadow, and from Tito Puente to the Sparks Brothers. And at the middle of all of it, we've got a compilation album that just happened to feature these tracks. Even Annette Tucker's other hit is featured on the 1998 reissue alongside Kenny and the Casuals. Maybe I didn't find a lost Electric Prunes record, but the story along the way just touched so much music history. One thing I love about music history is how all of these strands are connected, touching other musicians and influencing things decades down the line. Who knows? Maybe those post-reunion Electric Prunes records may take on a life of their own yet. Thanks for watching. I had too much to drink last night Too much to drink I'm not ready to face the life I had too much to drink last night Last night If you guys have made it to the end of this video, it would mean a lot to me if you'd consider uh, subscribing and if you really like the content that I do, I'm going to be launching a Patreon. Basically, um, I make no fucking money on these videos because of all the music I use. And shit like... Like the Axelrod thing that I had to buy for research and stuff. Uh, this stuff just takes time and money. I want to stress that the Patreon is completely optional. Uh, the response to my last video was, was so incredible. I never really thought that I make something that resonated with people that much and it's really encouraging um so the patreon is completely optional i'm just happy that i can make things people like basically it's just another way to support me but subscribe comment all that stuff actually does like i i know everyone says this like oh i read every comment i literally read every comment even the stupid ones so um honestly so much love to you guys thanks so much for watching